Kom hier, joh. Je kracht het. Samuel Leibovitz is a member of an ultra-orthodox Jewish sect and has been in prison for the last nine years for drug trafficking. Released from prison, he plans to return to his community in North London to try and live once again the life of an observant Hasidic Jew. Samuel comes from Stamford Hill, a closed community that is hostile to the media and has almost never been filmed. It's a community of about 20,000 extremely devout Jews who live according to the rules and customs of Judaism that date back to village life in Eastern Europe several centuries ago. I hope they will accept me back the way it's supposed to be, a normal family. And I hope I'll be able to prove them that I have changed and they won't regret it. Samuel is 38 years old and has spent half his adult life in prison in three different countries. Both his arranged marriages ended in divorce and he has no contact with his two children. Released from prison on condition that he remains electronically tagged and observes a curfew at night for the next five months, he now has to choose between his life of crime or religious conformity. Don't move around the foot because it's hard plastic inside. Samuel's family refused to be filmed, having no interest in the media or the outside world. But his brother Isaac made an exception. How hard a challenge do you think it is to go from all those years in prison to leading a devout life in Stamford Hill? Yeah, it will be very difficult because obviously, first of all, he will obviously have had now years of a different lifestyle, coming back to a very strict and disciplined lifestyle in a complete different way as the prison discipline which will obviously be very difficult for him um, he will obviously have mixed with a lot of non-jewish people which obviously would have affected his mind his way of thinking he's now coming back to a very narrow minded community which has got one way and one way only which is not going to be easy for him it's a very closed community. Um, they keep themselves to themselves. They're very law-abiding, by and large. They're very family-orientated. They won't allow, uh, most of them, a computer into the house, or certainly not the internet function of a computer. Their children aren't allowed to go out to the cinema. And it's really almost 18th century. You know, it's all books and it's all study. It's all self-improvement. Really, we could learn a lot from them, I think. Every minute aspect of life in this community is regulated by rules, from how you behave to what you can wear and how you spend each hour of every day. Boys and girls are educated separately and marriages are arranged. Women are homemakers and rarely drive a car. Men devote themselves to a life of religious learning and spend as much as six hours every day studying Jewish texts. Is it an issue for a man to look at a non-Orthodox woman in the eye? Is that, an, is that an issue? It's even an issue for a man to look into a woman's face. And presumably to touch a woman is, who's not your wife is not okay. That's correct. So you wouldn't shake my hand? It's better not to shake hands. Better not to shake hands. Yeah. And if I was um, a very observant Jew, 
What would I do? I would look down when I passed a man in the street? Don't look into his eyes, yeah. Right. But I can look at his feet. <laughs> can I look at his knees? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> you were raised in a strict Hasidic way as a Satma Jew. Yeah. Can you just explain what does that mean? Satma, well, in the Orthodox world, you have loads of different kinds of sects. Like you have the Lubavitch sect, you have a sect called the Gur, the Vajnit sect. You do have a sect very big called the Satma. That is where I was brought up. Is it's a very, very close community, and they're very, they're worldwide. What kind of clothes would you have been wearing then? The proper uniform that I'm wearing nowadays, which is a hat in the week in the weekdays, and a fur hat on the on the Sabbath, which we call it a strimal. Up it goes, and looks like a soldier. Well, obviously, it, did, it took the suspicion off from the customs when you walk through the... Because obviously every non-Jew would not expect, uh, suspect a Jewish person walking through the customs with drugs. So it was quite good to use the uniform for trafficking the drugs. And during that time, were you still observing your faith? Oh, sure. Even my time in prison, I never gave my faith up for anything. It doesn't say because I've, do, I've done drug trafficking, I don't have to observe God anymore. Yeah, so I ca always kept my faith. We're seeing quite a lot of Hasidic men walking around. Where are they all going? Uh, now it's 10 to 11. Some of them are coming from the synagogue. They've been praying uh, Shacharit, which is the first prayer of the morning. And some of them are going to work, some of them are going to all different businesses. And when will they have to go back to the synagogue for the second prayers? The most important prayer to go to the synagogue is the one in the morning. There's another prayer which, uh, which is in the afternoon before sunset, anytime before sunset. And then the third prayer is in the evening, which is after nightfall, which can be any time, but normally people do it like until midnight. And they do that in the synagogue as well? That's correct, yeah. So they're toing and froing three times a day? That's correct, yeah. How unusual is Samuel in the community to have been in prison all that time and to have committed the kind I mean, of I mean, he's obviously unique. There isn't another such a case. In all my experience, I have never had of the dozens of drugs cases in which I've defended or had experience of professionally, I've never had an Orthodox Jew involved. Samuel's curfew is from 6.45 in the evening to 6.45 in the morning. During this time, he cannot leave his flat. What is your view of his crimes? I mean, what, how does Judaism view drug dealing? Well, we think it's dreadful. I mean, it's dreadful because it's against the law of the country. And he's also bringing disrepute to the community, which is, which is, which is bad, which isn't a good thing, and I think he's aware of that. Mrs Simons is a prominent member of the community. She runs several caring organisations, a Jewish housing association, a mother and baby home, and an old people's home, where she's found a job for Samuel. Yes, Mrs. Samuel has offered me the job over here. And why do you think she's offered you the job? Want to help me reintegrate into the community? Because I didn't ask her, she offered my father, yeah, this and that, to help me. So. She's got interest to get me back into the community, to, be, to become normal again. It gives you a different feeling of being away so many years, doing so much things that you shouldn't have done. And you do find somebody who is actually opening their hands to you. They don't push you away. It's, it's amazing. I was very happy to have a good inmate, padmate, whatever they call them. Cellmate. Cellmate. Can you tell me what he was in for? Yes, he was in for trying to kill his wife put explosives in her car. 
Do you find it upsetting when someone tells you they've tried to kill their wife? No. If that's what he wants, good luck to him. How feasible is it, do you think, to return to what is the relatively closed community like this once someone like Samuel has seen the kind of... And open, openness and permissiveness. Yeah. And so I would imagine that it's terribly difficult for him to sort of come back and, I, I mean, I suppose he'll never become this innocent, um, innocent soul that many of the young men and women that you see up and down the roads at Stamford Hill are. Do you think the community depends for its survival on turning its back on the outside world? Well, I think that it's very difficult. It's safer. The less you know, the better. Because our philosophy is so, so different to, to a lot of public uh, uh, ideas of life and the meaning of life, that, of course, it's a lot easier and much safer for particularly our youngsters um, not to be exposed to it. I call you Isaac, but what does everyone else call Yitzhak. you? Yitzchak. It's my Hebrew name, Yitzchak. And I call Samuel Samuel. What Shmilu. Shmilu is his Yiddish name, or nickname. Well, Shmuel is his Hebrew name. Hebrew nickname is Shmilu, and English name is Samuel. Can you tell me, what's your first language? Yiddish. Ask me why Yiddish, because Yiddish is a language we spoke at home as we, since I was born. And we studied that in school in Haida. We studied Yiddish all our life. And can you explain what Yiddish is? Yiddish is a European language. It's very similar to German or Dutch. It's basically it's a language that's been spoken before the war in Europe by the Jewish people. But it's not the national language of any country? No. Yiddish is a, is a language of Jewish people, it's not a country. And how much general education, not religious education, did you have? It was in school. Like, every day we learned uh, normal lessons. The English lessons we had. Geography, history... Geography, history, maths, sports, everything. Like in a normal school. Or we didn't have it as in a normal Gentile school, which I have it all day. Right? But we had it like as... Most of the day was learned Jewish law and Yiddish. And then we had certain hours in the day that we learned English, was spe specifically for English studies. So your general education stops at 14? Uh, yes. Or 13 or 14, yeah. So that must make it quite hard to do quite a lot of jobs. What do you mean? Well, because for most jobs you, you need training beyond the age of 14. You mean, you mean to have certificates and stuff like that? In our community, I find that we, you don't need it because if you got if you got a grocery shop, somebody will just take you for what you are because they know you, or you'll find out about you. You don't need to come with uh, degrees and stuff like that. Or if you go, or if you work in jewelry, if you need to become a salesman, you just just pick it. I mean, I'm a property dealer. I've never le le learned a trade, but I'm doing it and I'm earning my living. Uh, People who want to work, they don't need any degrees. They can just go for it and they can make money. <laughs> All these biscuits are made without animal fat. And what about butter that you might put in biscuits? Butter. Well, again, the butter is 100% OK. But the reason we don't eat the butter from non-Jewish because in olden days, or maybe still do today, I don't know, they could be using uh, animal, fat. animal fat that are, that is not kosher, like pig. But you can't milk a pig. Why not? Can you? Yes. Do people drink pig's yes. milk? Milk? Yeah. Oh, pig, no. no? Uh, yes. Camel milk's milk. No, 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 it is pig's milk, yes. There is pig's milk, yep. 
<laughs> no, let's talk about milk. Now you have to cut this out too much. <laughs> What is there that's not in right. these biscuits? In here, you have many times, like your bread, or, okay, Swiss bread is allowed to be eaten because they don't use, they don't use lard to, for the baking sheets, right? <laughs> so there's no, there's no pig's milk? No, 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 one second, one second, one second. There's these biscuits that you see on the shelf and all these kosher products, they have, they were, they are produced with no animal fat at all. And if you do find a biscuit that will have butter in it, will be written on it, it's milky. So there's a difference between milky and parav. Parav means there's no animal yeah, fat. Yeah, you're going to another subject anything. now. You're going no. to another complete She's talking thing. about the biscuits, not, not about the milk. Yeah, but the biscuits could have yeah. animal fat in it. Yeah, but not a kosher biscuit. Not a kosher one, no. That's what I said to you. Kosher biscuit. Purely vegetarian. Any kosher biscuit. Cannot biscuits. have no animal fat at all. Correct. Unless that it's is. milky, that's something else completely. You do find... It's getting complicated, this. I mean, I will say most women got over four children. Some of them got eight, ten, twelve. So it's like one of the good deeds from the Torah that Hashem gave us. Uh, not to stop to have children, to have as many as, as, many as you can. I mean, if you feel healthy enough to have an extra child, you just go for it. This woman sells shoes to the Hasidic ladies of Stamford Hill. This one? Yes, please. That's nice. Can I just ask you how many children you have? I have a little family of 12 kids. My oldest one is a girl, and then I have 10 boys, and then we came the little princess. And you managed to run your own business and look after 12 children. Where are the other 11? The school. Avi, can you explain to me what the rules are for how women dress? Uh, women have got to be dressed appropriately, which means they've got to, they're only allowed to show from the knee downwards in the legs and in the arms from the elbow downwards. And once a woman is married, then she's got to cover her hair because it becomes like a private part. And can you explain why they would be wearing wigs and hats? Some of the wigs are, they look really too modern. They, sometimes the wig look more, look, look, look nicer than the actual art itself, than the actual hair itself. So they wear on top of it something to make it shouldn't, shouldn't be too attractive, basically. And what would be bad about being too attractive? According to the, according to the Torah, a man is not, about, not, not supposed to, to be wanting another woman who is not, who's not his wife. So the idea is that women should not be encouraging men to desire them because the men should be faithful to their wives? That's correct, yes. Is that your hair I can see? No. Wouldn't be. I'm married, I have so my hair is covered. So you've covered it twice? Yeah. <laughs> That's a stringent, stringency that I've taken upon myself, um, which most Hasidic ladies do have double covering. Make sure you're... Make sure people don't think, like you thought, maybe that is your hair, so we put the hat on top to make sure that you know that we're married. It's five weeks since Samuel came out of prison, and he's moved house to a bigger flat. Can you explain to me how come you've moved here? How come I moved here? First of all, it's more space. And it's closer to my brother, closer to the rabbi, close to my, closer to the synagogue. It's small. It's easier for me for the weekends, mainly so. And who's made it possible? Mr. Berger, Samuel Berger, obviously, it's his property, the whole house. He's offered me this flat. And he's the same guy who paid your legal expenses, isn't he? he yeah, he did some of it, yes. And why is he helping you? Concern. Good heart. Has he known you all your life? Oh, yeah, we know. He, basically, he's a family friend many, many years. His father still was a very good friend to my father, very close. So we have a history going back. This is the remarkable thing about this community. If anyone is in trouble, they club round. That if anyone is sick, if anyone is uh, pregnant, if anyone is in hospital and so the family need people to bring in food, whatever it might be, if there's a bereavement, the way that the community rallies round is simply exceptional and therefore it was quite normal 
that if uh, a man like Mr. Berger obviously is a very wealthy man, that he would be asked to help and that he would put his, his hand in his pocket. I mean, this is so normal for this community that I've had so many cases where they have come together in order to assist somebody who is in trouble, be it the kind of trouble I specialize in or be it more normal troubles of life. This woman offers a charitable service to the community, lending out kosher crockery and cutlery from her home. Other households offer items such as carpet shampooers, wigs, baby equipment and circumcision cushions. This practice is known as gemach. Can you just explain to me um, what gemach is or even what it means? Do you really not know? Gemach really is translation of me. It stands for gemilas chasadim, which means acts of kindness. So basically any service which could help people, benefit people, you know, that kind of thing. And there's all sorts of gemachs. There's uh, gemachs for anything from baby equipment to wedding dresses, you know, and everything in between. How do people find you? How do they know that you've got milky oh, because, crockery? Um, it's in the telephone book on the so the gamach, so they know. And then it's word of mouth. And they do know. Because everybody's got the phone book, the Jewish phone book. So it's there. Are you Jewish? Yes. Yeah, you are. Although this woman agreed to be filmed, because of the rules surrounding female modesty, I was subsequently asked not to name her or show her face in order to avoid compromising her spirituality. Now let's go into the kitchen. Obviously, the kitchen will be quite interesting to you. This is a typical Jewish kosher kitchen with the two sinks separated for the meat and milky side. What's in your fridge? Yeah, you don't want to see that. My addiction. My cream cakes. So how many cakes are in there? In here right now, there's two, four, six, eight pieces. Plus, we have some more goodies. All cream cakes, Vanessa. <laughs> get the rest of them out. Get them all out, you say. This is one of my weak addictions. And another piece of Swiss roll cake, which I love. And when will they all be gone by? They'll be gone by tonight. Tomorrow's going to be a fresh stock. <laughs> And have you got Jewish neighbours, Samuel? Yes. I don't know on these sides. I don't know if they're Jews on this side, but for all over there, it's all Jews. They're all Orthodox Jewish people, so... And my brother, if you, see, if you look at the street up there, that's where my brother lives. Isaac, he's just... third house from the corner. And where are your parents from here? My parents from here will be, if I go up to the end of the road, cross over the main road, Kaivigaray Road, Fursby Road, that's where they live. So it's quite close to each other. But is it better or does it feel a bit stifling? No, it's all right. For the meantime, it's okay. I mean, uh, look, I live my own life. Nobody tells me how to live it, what to do. Oh, Yves, uh, what does he want? Yeah. Huh? Hennish? BBC? Gesugnes is? No, I'm glandish. So we can be a host. So we can be a meer, meer, if he does. Huh? I've been away for a few years. Yeah. So, <laughs> shit. It does sound like, in some ways, it's very restrictive. That you know, with the neighbours poking their noses, you know, people are keeping an eye on you. The rules here are very strict. Is it tougher for you living in this community now than it was in prison? Well, in a way, yes. It's not easy. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. It's a very strict community. But this is the choice I took for the meantime. That, yes, I'm going to try and come back to the community. To be as strict to a certain level. Obviously, within my house, I live my rules. I live the rules as God told, tells us to live. But... There will be certain things that I will not be doing it in my home, which is really up to me. I make my own decisions. 
So, for example, you've got a television downstairs. Yes. And that's something that's not really allowed in the community. Again, it's not. It, it doesn't say in the Bible one should not have a television. Why don't we have televisions, which is a proper good reason, that you can see things one should not see on a television, which is understandable. It's, it's very understandable, by the way. We know that if you have spare time, one should be studying the Jewish law, right? So you try to put everything in. You study the law, you study this, and you watch a bit of news, you watch a nice good sports program on the television. And I don't think there's anything bad with it. Do you have a television in the house? No because I did not want the children to see um, bad things. What are the things that they might see on television that would concern violence. you? Violence and hear a lot about drugs. And they need to know. They, they can be affected. This woman offers a charitable service that helps women protect their modesty. She sews up the slits in their skirts. My skirt has <laughs> got this. Well, see, this got that. Yeah. Would you need to I'll sew to that up? Yeah. You close that gap. Yeah. yeah. And so you sew up slits at the front and slits at the back? Yeah, whatever is open. And is it just skirts that have problematic slits? Mainly. Mainly. Is it written somewhere about slits? No, no. It just, it's just written to be covered. Like, you know, quite away after your knee and till here. Because once you start, you can, you know, once you're allowed more and more and more, then, you know, you ever do it. But this, therefore, we've got Boundaries, it's called. And that's it. Schmeichel means smile. Basically, that, that's what we do. I mean, we call ourselves the Cheer Up Squad. Um, one of our slogans is we spread uh, laughter when needed most. And you're all volunteers, is that how it works? Yes, yes. certainly all volunteers. <laughs> It's early February and the community is preparing for Purim, a joyous annual Jewish festival that is celebrated with the exchange of gifts and sweets. We give to each other presents with popcorn things, like, which is a, pre a present for each other, which is made for a nice popcorn piece. 
put in a sweetened chocolate, give it like this. When it comes to older people, like people who are married or people who has got all these little things already, then people will give them a clock, which they will use like to hang on a handbag or something like this. But most of the presents that people will give will be things to, which goes together with food and chocolates. <laughs> A lot of people who has got more busy families, people will use something like this, which is a cereal dispenser, which is a cereal dispenser that for more busy families who has got a lot of kids, the kids eat easier, but for now we will fill it up like with nuts and chocolates and then afterwards they can use it for any other thing. I can show you something else which is very different that we do sell quite a lot. It's something like this, which is a CD card, a card player, which put in a CD. It's also something that people do have, but don't have it. It is a present. If you give it, some people will give it to someone else, but they won't buy it by themselves. <laughs> How did you go from being a nice settler boy and doing all your studying to falling in with a bad crowd? What happened? Simple. I lived, I lived at home, yeah, and I had pressure from my parents or friends or community. And I looked for a bit of action, I looked on, for a bit of attention, so somebody should call me, some, somebody should, like, people should be looking for me all the time. That was one of the problems, what got me into it, L looking for attention. I was a, a very much, at my younger age, I was an attention seeker. But at a certain point, you crossed the line and you started doing things that there was a reason not to do, like break the law. But it comes really automatically, one leads to the other. Does it? Yeah, when it, you know it very well. Once you start going down the hill, you go down the hill all the way. You understand? There's reasons for everything why a person does it. Obviously, you must have been let down from one thing. One thing leads to another. So once you start going down the hill, you're gone. My first sort of drug involvement was I was sent down to Brazil to bring back two pack. Two, I was told, you want to fly down to Brazil, you're going to get everything paid, a nice holiday for about between 10 to 15 days. I said, yeah, I've never been to Brazil. Yes, why not? I didn't know what drugs is. I was, I was with the curls, with everything. A Yiddish, a Yiddish boy. What do I know about drugs? I've never seen drugs in my life. Finally, he explains to me what it is, drugs, I said, wow, 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 so what? And I know how much we, he paid for it down there. And I said, what are you selling for so much? He told me the price, what he's selling it further for. He was getting per kilo $60,000. I said, blimey, let's do it more times. <laughs> now I know already what drugs is, why people use it, people feel good, feel high with it. Right, let's go again. Two weeks later, we're done again. In 1994, as he was leaving Brazil, Samuel was arrested for the first time on drugs charges. So after you came out of prison in Brazil, yeah. um, you came back to London, is that right? Yes. And you came back to this community? I did. My father then at the time said, I'm going to help you, I'm willing to help you with this, with that, with that, with this, but you've got to, we, we want you close to us. I said, okay. Didn't work out, did it? And why didn't it work out that time? Why didn't it work out? Because it didn't work out. It just brought things worse and worse and got me doing it again. And how quickly were you arrested that time? Eight, nine months after I got home. I was arrested in Calais. Yeah. And what were you arrested for that time? Importation of drugs. What were the drugs that time? Okay. So then you, your father put up twenty-five thousand pounds of bail. Yeah. You jumped bail. Yeah. 
and went to Israel. That's right. And then Israel committed another crime. So in Israel, in Jerusalem, a Jewish guy, Orthodox Jewish boy, he managed to persuade me. We flew down to South America, bringing back the stuff in Tel Aviv. How did you bring it back? It was packed. So we don't have to go into specific details, how, what, when. I'm not under investigation, am I? Just curious. Yeah, so... Did you swallow it, Samuel? What's the difference? <laughs> so that's quite a risky thing to do. You yeah, can die really, that yeah, way. No, Samuel. you can't die from that way. Well, it's not true. You can. People do. People I've die because they don't have to pack it. Oh, okay, you know how to pack it. Unfortunately, yeah, I used to know how to pack it very well. I could keep drugs. I could. Ah, oh, no, no, leave it. What do you pack it in? A condom, is that right? Condoms, baking paper, newspaper, tissue. And then you swallow and all of that? Foil. Yeah. And silver foil as well, so. Man, that must be hard to swallow. Oh, it's a capsule as big as your finger. I could, I could swallow a pickle without chewing it. Go on then. I'll, do, I'll show you in a second, just for the fun of it. And how many of those would you swallow? Depends, 90, 100. You're kidding. Not. By the way, what are you making, Samuel? I'm making a potato salad now. Forgot to buy peas and carrots. I've just got some eggs on the stove with mayonnaise. So I'm going to do it with the pickles, with sour pickles, eggs, mayonnaise, and potatoes. Yeah, one second. Let's cut the edges off. I'll drink a drop of water first. Oh, Vanessa, Vanessa. Don't make me laugh. It'll go on. Don't make me laugh. In total, Samuel has served four years in prison in Brazil, eight years in prison in Israel, and a year in prison in the UK for importing both cocaine and heroin. <laughs> On the evening of Purim, Samuel is under curfew and can't join in the festivities. time for charity. People go from house to house collecting money for local causes. Samuel too is involved in his own act of charity. He is offered to make a Friday night meal and celebrate the Sabbath with a number of homeless boys from the community. Only one boy turns up. So, you were brought up in the Hasidic community, is that right? Yes, sort of. So you were, you were Hasidic like Samuel? No, not, not like him, but, yeah. I wasn't so religious, but I was brought up in a, in a quite religious family. And, uh, and then what happened? And then, yeah, you know, as always, most, the, most teenagers, you know, they go for a sort of thing, you know, which sort of make them go the other way. But... But you still 
You still wear the kippah? You still go to synagogue or not so much? Not so much synagogue, no. Would you say you're still part of this community? Mm, not very much, you know. He doesn't want to be, but he is. <laughs> sort of. And is that must be quite hard? Well, yeah, it is quite hard, you know, you know, but again, what has to be done, it's got to be done, if you know what I mean. But it sounds like it's quite hard to make those kind of choices in this community. You either live by the rules, otherwise yeah. it's hard to know where to go. Yeah, it is quite hard, but as I said, it's got to be done, because I was brought up to be Jewish, so that's where I'm staying. Why is he here? Has, his, has he rejected his family, or have they rejected him? He got kicked out of home. Because he stopped being observant? No, 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 no. It's got nothing to Just because of family his, problems? His mother gave him too much problem, him and his older brother. Don't do this, don't do that. You know, like punishment, clean the house, hoover the house. It wasn't hoover properly, hoover it again. And Samuel, do you identify with these boys? Do a you lot. think you went through something similar lot, when you yes. were young? I went through a lot. The main reason why I decided years ago to start to be in a rebellion was my parents. Uh, telling me, oh, you can't wear this kind of shirt, you can't wear this trousers, shoes like this. Oh, no, you must be joking with her. You must be joking. With a, with a point, no way. And I wanted to have it, because I like it, it's nice shoes. That's what I wanted, why can't I have it? Look, is there anything wrong? What do you think, is there anything wrong with these shoes? I don't think so. But when I was his age, I couldn't wear it. Why not? I was told no. But you weren't given a reason? No. Too modern, too modern, too this, yeah. It's not for you, but it's not a reason that's going to satisfy a 17-year-old boy. Was your upbringing very strict, would you say? Abnormally strict or just normally strict? Well, within the community, it's normal. You know, I mean, my father's not a strict uh, 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 person in terms of extreme. You know, obviously, we were all dressed Hasidic and we were all eating Hasidic, kosher and everything else. And going to the... Uh, you would call it strict from... Your point of view, you know, from a general point of view, but within the community, that was the normal way how we are being brought up. That's the way I bring up my children. That's the way the community generally operates. The rules drawn from the Torah that govern behaviour have also informed the Leibovitz's attitude to forgiveness. Despite Samuel's reoffending, his family have helped him again and again. We felt, let's give him one more chance. And when you say we felt, do you mean um, that it was, again, that they're quite specific obligations that you have as Jews, or just we felt because he's a family member and you love him? Well, I think the family member thing has faded away, to be honest, after so many setbacks. But it was a, as a Jewish commitment as well. I mean, for example, I mean, we, we went to a rabbi to speak about this, and the rabbi told us, look, we pray three times a day for forgiveness. So this whole philosophy is, okay, we're not perfect, but let's try again. So on that philosophy, the rabbi strongly encouraged us, yes, we should get private lawyers and give him a better chance if we can, which we followed. But we were reluctant to do so at first. I mean, one of the things he seems to find difficult is that in the communities that everybody wants to know what everybody else is doing and that people kind of... Yeah, that, that's true. Is that a downside? Do you find that a difficult part of the life? I don't life? find it difficult. I live with it. Um, whether I find it difficult or not, it's not I have a choice. Well, of course, everybody has a choice. I could decide to go to Spain as well, Brazil, and leave the community. But that's the conflict. You can't have it. You can't have it both ways. If you want to live in a community within the very close environment, everybody will know what everybody's doing. It's like we have a large extended family. It's good to have a large extended family, but the downside is everybody knows where you where you've been last night and what you're doing tomorrow. But yeah, you can't, you can't have what he wants and the community. He needs to make up his mind. Oi. 
I'll, I'll go to talk about you. Eventually, get the police, man. Okay? Tchau, um beijo, tchau. It's a Brazilian friend of mine. I mean, for argument's sake, if he would be working, if he would be walking on the street with a Brazilian girl in Stanford Hill, that would be it. Although there's nothing wrong with it, theoretically, you would say. But the community would just say, all right, fine. You want to do that? Goodbye. But he does seem to be in contact with all sorts of Brazilian girls. He is, and the community's so far as whilst he's discreet about it, then he'll get away with it. But the day will come that it will explode. And so if he flaunts in a sort of disrespectful way, then the community would turn their back on him oh, at yeah. some point. Bom dia. Como vai? So you're driving a Lexus? I am. I'm driving a nice Lexus right now for two weeks. Got my friend's car, took him to the States, and left the car with me. And so you're not working in the old age home anymore? No, I'm helping out a friend of mine in properties. So what I do for him all day is go around to his properties, check them, make sure they're kept up to standard and the rents are paid. And bits and pieces. Keeps me busy. And it's not a full time, but, you know, keeps me busy. And is that a good job for you? It's OK. Can't complain. What happens if people are not forthcoming with their rent? Well, that's where we try to get them out if they don't pay the rent. Obviously, legal ways, nothing illegal. But sometimes things have to get done. Like before the holiday, I went to get, I went down to someone, a Polish guy. He hasn't paid the rent now for two and a half months. I came down to him and I said, "What's happening with the rent? You got to pay rent." So I don't have, I don't have money. So well, if you don't have money, you got to leave. And I made, I made sure he left. How did you make sure? He didn't want to leave the premises, so I went out. I got a friend of mine who's got some dogs. Came in, they opened the door, put the dogs in. And the next day he called me up and says, I'm come, uh, can I come down and take my belongings? I said, yes. As long as the property will be empty, you can come and take your stuff. What kind of dogs are they? Alsatian dogs. Car dogs. So do you have to physically threaten anybody? No, no, I don't. I, don't, I wouldn't go violently anymore. I used to, but no more. I do it nice and easy. Come down, they've got the keys to the door. Open the door, put two dogs in when you're not home. And you, you just can't get back in. The Hasidic Jewish community of Stamford Hill runs its own emergency service called Hapsola. You're a volunteer? I'm a volunteer, yes. And how long have you been volunteering? Um, I think it's nine years now. I've been doing this for nine years. And how many times a week do you do it? Um, Mondays and Thursdays, from 9 till 1, 5 till 8. Um, I think it's nine years now. I've been doing this for nine years. And how many times a week do you do it? Um, Mondays and Thursdays, from 9 till 1, 5 till 8. Um, Wednesday morning, from 9 till 12. Okay. Hatsala. Any urine bags? Uh, um, I'm not too sure about that. Can you give me your phone number and I'll get someone to ring you? Hatsola is funded by donations from the community and staffed exclusively by volunteers who are trained paramedics. Can you just tell me what you do for a living? My business life is management of and lettings and management of residential properties, flats, and a few shops here and there. So nothing medical there? None whatsoever. We're going to a communal building where somebody has a very deep cut.
Okay. So, what's the matter? 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 What's the And how are things going with you and your parents, Samuel? Yeah, that's all right. Are you seeing much of them? Not really, because... I go to them every now and then, if, you know, if they need me, they call me. I wouldn't, you know... It's a good and bad relationship, you know what I mean? A good and hate relationship, whatever you call it. It's like every child with his parents, they're angry, they're this, your mother's angry at you, you're angry at your mother. Ain't easy. And when I came to them for the holiday now for this first day meal in lunchtime, my mother goes, oh, why do you have to wear perfume like that? Why do you have to wear a shirt like that? I said, mom, because that's what I want to wear. Have you got a problem with it? You know, you know, and all that stuff. Let's try and start it again, but I wouldn't give it a chance. What's wrong with wearing perfume, Samuel? Ask me. I, I ask the same question. Is that not a Hasidic thing to do? Apparently she says not. So I told her to check her sources out to see that Hasidic boys also wear perfume. And I wore this white, silver and white shirt, which is, like, very shouting out. She goes, why do you have to wear a shirt like that? Why can't you wear a normal white shirt? Because I don't want to wear a white shirt. I want to wear that. Would the community find him a wife now if he wanted one? Oh, yeah. But you can't find somebody a wife. I mean, he's got to want one. He's got to... Is he a marriageable prospect? I think so, yeah. I think it would do him a world of good. I mean, the wife has got to be a strong character, but it would do the world a lot of to settle him down. Mrs. Cypris lives the life of an archetypal wife and mother in Stamford Hill. She has eight children. When it gets very hot, do you still have to wear tights? Um, your legs have to be covered. At what age do girls have to cover up? Children. Um, that very much depends on, on the community, you know, the, the different... Uh... But in your family, at what age would you...? Well, the, from 12, a girl is considered a lady. So the laws of dressing modestly would, would apply, but we generally um, wouldn't wait till 12. You know, a girl would do it. Um, my children uh, would put on tights from the age of three. Can you tell us what it means, Samuel? Yes. She's talking about the person who's got beautiful eyes and a good soul. Where did you disappear? For weeks. All I wanted is a real king. I wanted a Melech a real king, to wake up in the morning, to give my soul to him. It's like a love song, basically. So, Sam, you're listening to love songs. Have you got any special women in your life? Not yet, no. Hopefully one day someone will come. Have you been looking recently? Not really, no. I haven't been concentrating on it yet. I've got other things priority first. I want to settle myself before I can fall. Before I can start a relationship, I want to be settled.
Hello. Hi, Samuel. Yes, Hi, how are you? Yeah, nice to see you again. It's five months since Samuel was released, and the prison authorities have come to take his tag off. He hasn't broken his curfew or reoffended, and freedom beckons. Hey. That's it. At least the plastic is not on my foot anymore. It's already in a slight that, okay. That Thank you very much. Bye. 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 That's it. It's gone. Do you think your family are proud that you've lasted this long with your tag? I hope so. I don't care. Have you been seeing much of them? I saw my parents, yeah. They look happy, but it's not with my, that doesn't really concern me so much. So it's, you haven't formed a tight bond with them and no. seeing them all the time? No. Not at all. And why do you think that is? Do you feel disappointed about no. that? No. I, I feel much happier than this. I don't have to run to them every day. I'm not a baby. Yeah, but now then say hello to them. Fine, why not? It doesn't have to be constantly like they sit on your back and you sit on their back. And could you envisage staying here in the long term now? I don't know. You're, you're asking two difficult questions. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think I'll be, I can see myself in Stanford for the rest of my life. You want a bit more space? No, I don't know if I want to stay in England at all. I haven't made my choice if I want to stay at all in England. If I will stay in England, I, don't, I doubt it, it's going to be Stanford Hill. Maybe Golders Green, Hendon, Finchley, somewhere, I, even Edgware. Somewhere down there. But a lot of people have helped you, haven't they, in the last few months? Well, you, what do you mean by helped? Help, no, I've helped myself. They've just assisted me. Given, you know, give, not I, I didn't ask them for advice. My, my, most of the things I've done, I did, it, I did it myself. There are a few individuals, yes, they helped me, but they've helped me because, I guess, because I wanted, not because I want something back for it. And that's it. But I guess here, I mean, you've had offers of work and somewhere to live, and if you went somewhere else, that wouldn't necessarily be... Life might be hard. It's true. That, that was one of the reasons in the beginning for me coming back to the area. A few people said, you come back to the area, we will do this, we will do that. Fine. If they wouldn't have done it, I would have... Well, it's not that... I didn't come back to the area because of their help. I could have just got it as well anywhere, somewhere else. All right, without them, by myself. I mean, to get accommodation, you can get from the council accommodation. All right, it wouldn't be in a flat. It might have been in a hostel or something. But I would have got there. Wow.